Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Friday Innovate Pasadena Friday Coffee Meetup. I am Christy Connor. I'm the host. We are the largest active innovation, entrepreneurial, and tech meetup in Los Angeles, California. And now that we're back with Innovate Pasadena, we do invite you to learn more about them by visiting innovatepasadena.org. And we're also giving away some gift cards on their site. So go ahead and check that out. I am really pleased to welcome Jim Cooper and Ann Carpenter with us this morning. Jim has actually spoken for us. This will be his third time with us this morning, and we're so pleased to welcome him back. They are going to be speaking with us about Brave Theory and the Blue Economy this morning. The Blue Economy is a multidisciplinary business ecosystem that encompasses technologies found in many different industries. I'm going to list a few of them, and then they're going to walk us through a little more information about this. It can be technology from agriculture, food, water, energy, life science, aerospace, transportation, shipping, logistics, fisheries, aquaculture, and construction. I'm looking forward to learning more. As co-founders of Great Theory, Anne and Jim bring extensive business backgrounds to help um, launch companies through their accelerator and through partnerships. They have backgrounds in business, science, ocean, and maritime. We were just having a fun conversation about diving right before we got started. Bray Theory is also the host of Ignite 22 Global Tech Showcase that brings together innovators who are shaping the 22nd century. Please welcome Anne and Jim. We are looking forward to hearing from you today. Good morning, everyone. Hi there. Good morning. All right. So um, I'm Ann Carpenter, CEO of Braid Theory, and Jim. And I'm and Jim Cooper, CTO of Braid Theory. And I'm going to go ahead and get started and share the screen, and uh, we can kind of uh, get going. Uh, Jim, while, while I'm doing that, if you would, just uh, say a few words. Um, well, I hope everyone is uh, ready for this weekend and uh, uh, you've got something fun on to do. Uh, I know I will be having some fun this weekend. Well, I'm going to actually be on the ocean kayaking. So, yeah, <laughs> of course. All right. Let's, All right. Let's go for it. Um, I'm going to start and um, Anne and I are going to kind of tag team through this um, and um, hopefully uh, you'll get a good kind of an overview of, of um, the blue economy, um, what we do as a business and, uh, and also some opportunities that exist um, kind of around blue economy. Um, I, I, I usually like to say that, that people um, don't know that they're probably um, you know, walking around in the products of, of the blue economy or at some point um, the blue economy touches them, whether it's shipping and logistics or, or something. So, you know, that Amazon parcel that you get um, has probably come through a port and that port is probably either Long Beach or Los Angeles. Um, so, um, so today's talk is, uh, is about opportunities in our oceans. So what is the blue economy? Um, you know, broadly speaking, um, the blue economy is an ecosystem. It, it tries to solve problems in our ocean, um, marine, maritime sectors, and, uh, and broadly looks at different kinds of technologies, um, integrators, um, uh, contracts around, you know, RFPs and, um, and, and government needs. Um, there is a lot of companies around, uh, around shipping, obviously, um, but also oceanography, there are, is, are a lot of marine scientists that are doing um, uh, really important work on climate change, um, looking at species uh, in the ocean, uh, looking at fish and fish stocks, because uh, we, even within the United States exclusive economic zone, uh, which has been identified by NOAA as being one of the most important drivers for the economy in the next 10 years. Um, we look at things that are, uh, are also existing in market segments, um, things like robotics, life science, shipping, 
logistics ag tech, especially things that happen um, further upstream that then affect the, um, the, the downstream when they enter the ocean. Uh, so, you know, ocean run, uh, runoff and um, uh, stormwater drains. Um, energy, uh, there's lots of, um, lots of movement around ocean energy, but, but also things like biofuels are important too. Um, transportation, aerospace, even aerospace, you can monitor a lot, um, including um, discharge from, uh, from ships in port, from satellite data. Um, fisheries and aquaculture, obviously, and then clean tech. Um, our focus um, is broadly, more broadly, around commercialization of these products. Um, things that go into the ocean or things that come out of the ocean, um, cross and multidisciplinary. So it, it, it revolves around a lot of different kinds of science and engineering and enabling technologies. Um, it's cross and multi sectored. Um, the, the, the blue economy is so broad, um, as you can see from this diagram that we have on the, on the left-hand side, um, it includes things like the environment, tourism, um, agri agriculture and aquaculture, uh, fisheries, smart cities, even because there's so many ocean communities that butt up against the ocean and, and, and beaches, um, materials, um, and of course, you know, uh, deep sea and deep space, which have some very, very um, interesting connections and relationships. Um, the things that you build for the, for, for the for space can often be used in the deep ocean as well. Um, most of the companies that we like to see are in that science and engineering led um, kind of framework, um, but we do look at a lot of enabling technologies too. So hardware and software, um, particularly sensors and the things that drive those sensors. Um, you know, data and data sharing is becoming so important. Um, we, um, we see that as, as being a part of, of the movement forward through the blue economy. And, and that's the reason why that, that sector is going to, is going to grow. Um, we have a lot of existing infrastructure around the ocean. Um, ports, obviously, are the, the kind of the biggest part of that, um, that infrastructure. Um, and they're kind of obvious. Next slide, please. Um, and worldwide, we have um, a lot of different clusters and uh, kind of innovation districts um, that uh, provide us with kind of this, this wealth of, um, of new technologies, um, scientists that are kind of gathering, coalescing together around the blue economy to, to, to do interesting research. Um, a lot of these regions correlate with um, the large um, uh, countries that do a lot of shipping. Um, so places like Singapore, for example, is, is really important. But worldwide, we've got things like the, the Western Eurozone, which is um, concentrated around fisheries, uh, kelp and aquaculture. Uh, the Nordic countries obviously have um, a, a, a deep seafaring uh, tradition and also do a lot of fisheries. Um, they concentrate on, on things like value-added products and, and aquaculture. You know, um, Nordic countries have been um, instrumental in things like fish oils, which are important, you know, like in WD-40. Uh, I think that's the main component of WD-40, of fish oils. Uh, India and Southeast Asia looking at aquaculture there, in particular, um, shrimp aqu aquaculture. Uh, shipping and energy um, are also important uh, drivers in those economies. Um, and Australasia and, and Oceania, uh, fisheries, oceanography, environment, and reefs. Um, in US and Canada, we see a, a lot more movement um, starting to happen. Uh, they've kind of, um, uh, while Canada has had some really interesting early starts, um, you know, the United States has kind of been not very far behind. Uh, Pacific Northwest has concentrated around shipping, aquaculture, fisheries, and clean tech. Um, the Atlantic Maritime States and provinces uh, in aquaculture, environment, fisheries, and oceanography. South Florida and the Caribbean, uh, particularly uh, on um, coral and coastal resilience. Uh, these are really, really important, particularly during cyclone and, and, and hurricane seasons. Um, Southern California, kelp, energy, life science, ports and maritime and clean tech. Obviously, you know, the, the um, the kind of the elephant in the room are the are these these four ports that dominate the the um, the blue economy in Southern California, Waimea, um, San Diego, and then of course Long Beach and Los Angeles, uh, Hawaii, aquaculture and tourism, 
uh, and Alaska value added products, tourism, fisheries and fish processing. So we still have some fish processing in the United States. Next slide, please. So why Blue Tech? Why is this, why is this important? Well, um, NOAA released a report last, um, uh, last February. Um, they said that there is a, um, uh, there is a $450 billion um, opportunity by 2030 uh, in the Blue Tech sector. Um, these are technologies that are um, that are kind of in that um, in that realm of that kind of diagram we had in, you know, a couple of slides ago um, in in all of those market sectors. So you know things from um, from enabling technologies to uh, prevent stormwater runoff going into the oceans all the way through to you know satellites that are monitoring ocean temperature. Um, we saw we saw a 271 percent investment increase up to 2015 and it's been growing roughly at about 400 percent since uh 2016 so we've seen a lot more investment including things that are not necessarily related to the ocean but tangentially related to the ocean things like um uh, cellular agriculture or you know lab grown um fish products um so we're seeing a lot more interest in in the blue economy from uh from investors um is relatively nascent, so it's as a as an industry itself, it's it's kind of um, uh, growing, and there's still some teething issues. But it, it's a relatively greenfield opportunity for uh, for for people like investors and in industry uh, to enter into. There's a lot of opportunity there. Next slide. And why now? Well, because ninety percent of the uh, of the world is is um, is covered in ocean, and, but we only have a very small utilization of of ocean products. Um, it's very hard, obviously, to get to the deep parts of the ocean um, without a serious technology. And to find out what's at the bottom there, we need to um, um, we need to, to to develop technologies that allow us to investigate um, uh, to to investigate those regions and find new products. Or new ways of um, of um, multiplying our um, our technology and uh, discovery efforts here on Earth, on on the ground, terrestrial Earth. I mean, um, we saw a two hundred percent increase in ocean research activity in the last decade, which is good. Um, but typically, there's been a lack of expertise across multiple industries that are related to the ocean. So everyone has been siloed, and no one has had a kind of a broad multidisciplinary approach before. Um, it's the next frontier of development. Um, we see a lot more going into aerospace and looking at you know planetary discovery, but we're still lacking in some of some clear understandings about the ocean. Um, but we can be creative. We've got a lot of opportunity from a blue sky perspective to to kind of think, well, okay, will this work? Will this use case work in the ocean as well as on the land? Next slide. And you know, just to say on that, one of the things we really do see is the opportunities, is all the wealth of knowledge and, and research and tech that's here in Southern California that is in the clean tech sector, that it is in terrestrial opportunities, that's in life sciences. There's so many opportunities to rethink of new use cases in and around the blue economy. So we like to say that um, our Braid Theory model is a vertically integrated venture advisory. Um, we, do, um, we do quite a bit of stuff, um, uh, weaving together those um, uh, adopters, investors, influencers, you know, industry partners, um, and other strategic partners. We, we help to kind of coalesce entrepreneurs and get them thinking about, um, about how they um, uh, operate within the ecosystem. We help build them, scale them, even launch them. Sometimes we have a high level of domain expertise. Anne and I have been, I, I think, probably collectively working on um, ocean-related activities for um, a couple of decades now. So, um, so we have a, a lot of a lot of domain expertise in the in the blue economy. Um, and has some experience in um, in aerospace. I have experience in some life science. So you know, together we kind of cross a lot of that engineering and and um, and science kinds of um, um, kinds of discoveries and and interesting uh, technologies. And um, we've also built in as we broadened our group of of experts on it. We really bring in 
subject matter, matter, subject matter experts, whether it is in um, you know, product design and design thinking to uh, AI expertise, to marine science, to whatever it takes, because what we really see is um, a lot of a more generic uh, entrepreneur support, but we really go deep in the domains because it's necessary to, to really uh, support the entrepreneurs in that deep, um, deep knowledge way. Yeah. Um, we have a hybrid model of services. Um, we do strategic consulting, particularly for scale-ups. Um, we focus on commercialization primarily, uh, particularly with early stage companies that have um, that have a, a, a sometimes have a difficulty in getting that pathway to that commercialization. So we concentrate on the, what I call the three C's: of commercialization, um, capability, building that capability, that ability for them to do um, to actually do the work, do the science, do the engineering. Um, capacity building um, around making sure that they can fulfill an order and, and have follow, um, follow up orders. And then of course, um, the last C is capital, but it's split into two. It's, um, it's not just monetary capital, but it's also intellectual capital that, that, that grows the entrepreneur um, as an individual, as a, um, as a practitioner of um, evidence-based um, entrepreneurship. We have a um, incubation campus at Altersea, which Anne will talk to you a little bit about um, um, we have accelerator programming. Um, a number of that uh, uh, of those um, uh, startups are in pre-accelerator. We also do some, um, and, and Anne will talk about that a little bit more as well. Um, we have some uh, work with our um, government partners um, doing uh, building accelerator as a service. Uh, we do have supporting events, including our um, large event that's coming up in May called Ignite 22. Anne will also talk about that. Um, we help companies access capital. We leverage our ability to do grant writing. Um, we have a lab. We have a very small lab, but it's, it's good for synthetic biology. Um, we like to do things around robotics and prototyping, and we help companies investigate pilot projects, and sometimes we help lead them through that. Next slide, please. So this kind of is a, a kind of a, 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 a diagrammatic version of what I just um, just said. We have space uh, down at Alter Sea. Uh, we have um, uh, access to um, a, a broad range of capital. Um, we do uh, events and not just our large event, but we have smaller events too. Uh, we do a lot of programming. Uh, we have a unique pedagogy, which we believe has uh, allows us to um, help startups grow and grow into the um, into the industries. Um, we do some business development and strategic consulting as well for our scale-up companies. Next slide. And then finally, we have um, a strategic focus. Um, at, you know, we, we look at use cases as being the best way to uh, find that, you know, something like, say, an unfair advantage around, um, around what the market is, you know, found as to, to, to be salient. Um, it could be a, the best available control technology. It could be um, uh, the ability to do something um, that no one else can. It could be your, you know, leveraging partnerships and, and access to a channel to market that could provide that strategic focus. And, and we use the use case as a way to coalesce around that. So areas around digital solutions, particularly in AI and, and machine learning, um, miniaturization and ruggedization for aquatic environments, um, these are things that are becoming even more important and, and this uh, and the blue economy, economy is becoming more dependent on this. Um, energy density and storage, we're seeing a lot more of that. Uh, energy, uh, particularly ocean energy and biofuels and peak shaving as being um, important areas for discovery for startups. Synthetic biology is growing, is really, really growing. Building stuff from biology, I think, is going to be something that is going to um, propel us into the next um, the next uh, probably 100 years. Um, and so we've got to focus on building some of those early stage companies as well. Some of them are within our, uh, our latest cohort. Um, coastal resilience and environmental regen, um, food supply, especially value added ingredients, protein throughput and yield optimization, supply chain uh, tracking and traceability, particularly for seafood, um, that, that is a, a big problem. 
Um, and then ocean observation um, has been um, a kind of a hallmark of, of the last couple of years, um, particularly as we're focusing on that, um, uh, you know, in, in that NOAA report that I mentioned earlier, ocean observation has been identified as being one of the, the five drivers of the blue economy, uh, particularly in the, um, uh, in the exclusive economic zone for the United States. So it's a very important way of gathering data um, for um, the blue economy. So, and, uh, now oh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Anne. Yeah. So I don't really want to um, confuse you with this slide, but because as Jim mentioned, the port economy is so important to, um, to our region. A lot of times when companies come to us and they say, oh, they want to sell to the port and they don't really, they, they think that they're, um, pitching their product or service to a port authority. But what's really interesting is the port ecosystem is so complex. And so just when Jim was trying to kind of break out what the you know, sectors within blue economy, even within the port, you've got so many different layers and influencers and stakeholders in it. It's not just the port authorities, but you've got industry associations and unions and uh, social justice communities, regulatory. So you have a whole lot of influencers that are looking at, when you think about policies or um, uh, you know, regulation, this is part of where you're looking at where your opportunities are, because as you have to go to cleaner fuels or zero emission technology, each one of these steps on a regulatory side creates a, an opportunity for an unfair advantage for an entre entrepreneur working in that area. You also have to look at the ports not as um, a static uh, piece of real estate on the coast, but it's this whole goods movement ecosystem. We all saw through pandemic, the conversations around the uh, bottlenecks. Um, I live and work here in San Pedro, right at the port of LA. And at one point you could count more than a hundred cargo ships in just waiting in line to be unloaded. So everything around efficiencies and good, goods movement, anything in the clean tech sector that is making shipping cleaner or greener, this is all of very much of interest. And then of course, it's all related to a lot of the infrastructure side, road and rail, real estate, construction, utilities. So all of these things come together to say, okay, this is a very target rich environment for entrepreneurs to work in. It's also a very complex one because of so many different players. So that's one of the things that, you know, we as Braid Theory have navigated this ecosystem for the last decade. And so that's why that specialty of service is something that's really important to us and finding um, pilot project opportunities, grant opportunities, uh, you know, um, contracts and working with government agencies is something that we really uh, see as a need to support the entrepreneurs through. But the opportunities are huge. And then in addition to just the port operations, you've got this whole underlying environmental um, issue around uh, you know, both water and air. Um, some of the specific programs that Jim mentioned that we do is we have launched in January our first uh, cohort of uh, pre-accelerator and accelerator programs here in Los Angeles at our facility at Altice, which is um, actually right behind me, the picture. Uh, that is there. This is our Alta Sea campus, which is 35 acres on the port at the port of Los Angeles. We have waterfront space. We're in this uh, 80 plus year old warehouse. There's a complex of, I don't know, each building is 60,000 square feet. There's four buildings plus there's space for future development. Um, and so we host our accelerators and pre-accelerators. It's a hybrid this year. Uh, the pre-accelerator is uh, split into two different cohorts, one related to synthetic biology, as Jim mentioned, it's the Celsius lab, and we have access to our lab there. The other one, LA Blue, is more in that built uh, port maritime environment. 
So I kind of think of it like one's the science side, one's more the engineering side, but uh, you know, more industrial versus life sciences. And then we have an accelerator program that combines them both and is running concurrently here in LA. Our next launch will be uh, Florida. Uh, in South Florida, the issues are different. You have sea level rise, hurricanes, increased storms, um, you know, salt water literally bubbling up in the, um, in the backyards in Miami. Uh, you have a very different uh, marine ecosystem that's more related to coral. You have different industries like uh, more in the tourism and the cruise sector. So by having, being bi-coastal, we can support um, the entrepreneurs that are focused, as Jim said, on these use cases. Because even the, you know, the blue economy is so vast, but you really want to have programs where you can match the solutions and the needs uh, geographically. Uh, we started, before we started these accelerator programs, we've been offering, since we started, more of an accelerator as a service model. Uh, these are example of a couple of the things that we do for the government of Canada. We've run a number of programs related to clean tech for ports, and, uh, and then another one <clears throat> called an ocean tech highway, where these are not necessarily startups, but when they come to Los Angeles or Southern California to see about business opportunities, we work with them as their startups to really understand <clears throat> business models, <clears throat> excuse me, and opportunities in Southern California and how that might vary uh, from Canada. We also work with the US government through the uh, Department of Energy. Um, it's called the American Made Challenges. And so we, we are called the Blue Power Connectors, where we're supporting a number of initiatives related to wave energy and marine energy to power different use cases. First one, ocean observing, and now we're doing a second one on the Waves to Water Prize, which is using wave energy to support uh, desalination. Uh, the way we really, we couldn't do what we do. And frankly, none of the other clusters and in around Blue Economy can do it alone. So what we've done is really built a very, very deep network. Um, as Jim mentioned, things are cross-disciplinary, cross-industry. And so it's really important to bring all the stakeholders together when you're looking at supporting entrepreneurs. On the right-hand side, this is a little bit more of our Southern California ecosystem. I won't go through all the details, but obviously the port stakeholders, our university stakeholders, other incubators and accelerators in adjacencies, such as uh, Starburst and, and Lacey, um, you know, Biolabs at the Lundquist Institute, all of these uh, adjacent industry uh, communities, entrepreneur communities are really key to finding solutions in blue economy. And then on the other side is a little bit of similar of what we're doing in Florida. Some things of what's next is what's really interesting around uh, blue economy is when you start thinking about things like uh, kelp uh, are building kelp farms and then finding value-added products from the kelp. When you're looking at coral restoration or coastal resiliency projects, it's not really matching one um, solution to one customer. They're, they're much broader initiatives to solve bigger problems. And so our next uh, step in our evolution is really um, an advanced project initiatives. In South Florida, it's more related to coral. In LA, it's more related to um, plant aquaculture, right, seaweed aquaculture. But really it's looking more holistically on bringing together a number of entrepreneurs and solutions related to enabling to net technologies, going after larger pilot projects and opportunities, and really, um, you know, more closely what we really envisioned with Braid Theory about really bringing together these major strategic uh, partners to go after solving uh, deeper initiatives. Um, one way that we bring everybody together 
is our Ignite 22 event, which is coming up May 4th and 5th at our facility at Alta C. We'll have 60 to 80 entrepreneur teams front and center doing demos and exhibits all day long. We have, we start with a very future thinking panel. Are we, uh, with climate change, are we looking at overshoot? Uh, in which case it's uh, looking at uh, just surviving on the planet. Is there really an opportunity for a future topia where we have done everything right? Or is it really more about convergence, about really bringing together all these multidisciplinary different stakeholders together to solve what is gonna be challenging times for the rest of uh, human existence probably. Uh, so I just wanna at this point stop here. We, we were within our time, but it's not a huge group today. So really happy to take uh, questions and turn it more into a conversation. Uh, my colleague, Jim had to leave to do a, another or is leaving to do another presentation shortly. So I'm gonna stop the share I think also in the chat, our contact information is there and uh, we would be quite happy to um, take questions or continue the conversation. Yeah, thanks everyone. I've got to, I've got to head off and give a presentation um, uh, to our cohort, um, our accelerator cohort. So um, I'll talk to everyone later. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn um, uh, or shoot me an email. Thanks a lot, bye. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, Anne, for that very informative presentation. Um, if you're on the Zoom meeting, you can go ahead and place your questions in the Q&A panel. Um, I do see one though in the chat. Um, with climate change driving drought while at the same time ocean levels rising, what companies are working on desalinization for drinking and agriculture use? So it's really interesting what's going on in you know desalination. Traditionally, if you're looking at desal systems along the coast for providing water for the city of Los Angeles, there's some really strong and um, you know environmental issues about what do you do with the brine because you know as you think about it, as you get rid of the salt, you have this this uh, salty this brine solution that you have to get rid of. So there's there's uh, there's been um, you know, some real fits and starts. There's an interesting company that's a startup working here in LA that's looking at how to actually look at that brine and pull out all the very important minerals and salts and finding value add product from that, which until now really hasn't been a financially viable opportunity, but that's a super interesting way of thinking it. On the, I, I was just uh, participating um, on the East Coast, well, virtually for our teams that had do, um, for the Waves to Water competition, which went from design to build to drink. And so yesterday, actually this week, they're testing their systems in water. Um, there's a really interesting company out of Canada called Onika Water that um, is building small, medium, and large scale systems. And each one of those are very different use cases. I think right now, probably the most viable solutions from economic standpoint is not immediate disaster relief um, because it still might be cheaper literally to ship in bottles of water. But when you think about disaster zones, really wiping out you know, whole utility systems, water systems, sewage systems are completely wiped out and really can take years to rebuild. So sort of that near term, how do you provide fresh water? These are the places, you know, these are some of the business cases that we're seeing more for, for desal. Um, on the agricultural use is um, also very interesting because again, groundwater was cheaper but if you think about the last droughts, um, almond farmers in Central Valley went from drilling uh, for water 100 feet to more than 1,000 feet. So the cost of getting fresh water and plus our aquifers are being de depleted. So it's not just drought um, of what we see dry of what's coming um, from precipitation, but we're actually depleting our full um, our in-ground water supply. So definitely um, 
a lot of uh, need to continue to see other opportunities for desalination and not even that, but also the reuse of wastewater. And that seems to be for, for agriculture use, that's probably the more near term um, instead of a desal system. Yes, Thank I can you. Talk. Well, as you can see, we tend to dive pretty deep on uh, how we work with our companies and how we, the time we spend um, on these issues. It's pretty amazing. Looking at that network that you created on slide, I mean, how can you talk me through that process of creating that massive network and then how you manage that? Um, I know you have Ignite 22, which is really exciting, but what does that look like? Well, so first off, I, our tagline, when we started the company, our tagline is proving collaboration works. We never set out to be a, a resource heavy, bogged down a consulting organization. We always saw ourselves as something that the best way that we can solve the problems is be the ones that fill in the gaps in the ecosystem. So there's already plenty of uh, really good sort of general um, business incubators and accelerators, especially here in Southern California. There is a ton of domain expertise in and around the maritime and shipping sector. There are prizes, there are these other um, nonprofit organizations that bring specific expertise. So we never set out to try to do everything, but really see what does it take to get an entrepreneur from that ideation stage to the market? And to the market is the most important thing to do. And if that includes capital, you know, VC funding, non-dilutive, SBIR funding, whatever it might be, our whole goal is to get the entrepreneurs to the market. So if you're gonna do that, then to satisfy what they need, you have to really look at how can you connect them to the right places into the market? And the other thing that's really important is ocean solutions are global. So in, for some startups, a lot of startups, you say, okay, California, Southern California is a target rich environment. I'll land here and I'll have so many customers here. Well, if you have a solution for a port and your solution is here in Los Angeles, well, that terminal operator's next um, opportunity might be in Seattle or in Singapore or in uh, you know, Rotterdam. So you're already automatically, if you're in the blue tech space, you're a global, you have to think globally. And so we just facilitate that. And Jim and I both serve on, in an advisory role, um, volunteer role on numerous boards. Um, I, I serve on a international board called the, uh, of a group called the Smart Freight Center. I'm on the board of a group called Ocean Exchange. Jim's been involved in um, advising for the ICOR, NSF ICOR program and universities uh, mentors for decades. So that really helps, helps build that ecosystem. You have to be involved, you have to give into the community and then it comes back. How is your role, this is kind of a side one, but you know, your role as Chief Innovation Officer in Los Angeles, that's yet another role you bring on. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so that started, so first off, it was the first ever Chief Innovation Officer appointed in the city. So um, our Councilman Joe Buscaino just kind of pulled it out of the air and said, you know what we need, if we're really going to build this blue economy in Southern California, we need somebody who's really focused and who's going to give the attention to really think about it from the innovation side, not just from bringing companies here and so on. So that was how I became appointed to do that. So it's kind of an ambassador role. It's a signaling to the market that this is important and key. And it's now translating into very, um, uh, actionable ways. Uh, our company Braid Theory is one of 40-ish, about 40 organizations that's led by LAEDC and, uh, and Alta C on uh, the major Build Back Better regional um, grant opportunity. 
we got through the first round and got a phase one grant uh, earlier, uh, well, late last year, earlier this year. And we've just submitted a proposal that is a uh, for 70 plus million dollars in funding on the blue green economy around port, you know, improving uh, the transportation and goods movement sector through the use of thinking about blue green technologies and jobs and so on. So um, next up, we will be also participating in a similar initiative around hydrogen um, that is uh, looking to bring uh, billions of dollars into our region. So, you know, a, a role like a chief innovation officer is, is a signal, it's a catalyst, and it helps, you know, drive the thinking uh, on um, intention, I will say. Our next question is, what companies are working on automation and log shore operations? Ah, that's really interesting. So, um, so Longshore, so there are a couple of terminals, Long Beach Container Terminal or the Middle Harbor Project and the Trey Pack facility that have a fair amount of automation, right? Um, there are numerous uh, supporting technologies in, um, you know, whether it's uh, battery technologies or, um, you know, grid movement automation technologies, but here in Southern California, there is that clear dance. We have a huge uh, workforce from the Longshore, um, the union operations. And there is, um, there's always this overall thinking that automation in the big picture may not always be the right fit for, um, for operations, we we don't have we're so um, space constrained here in Los Angeles. Think of like a I don't know a Tetris game or something where you have to move something to make room for something to get something else going. Well, you can't just completely turn tear down a terminal that is running at full capacity plus to go ahead and implement a fully automated system. So you know, that, that's going to evolve over time. And, in, and honestly, our company is not really focused on, um, on pure automation at that scale and supporting companies that are doing it because it's going to be a, evolve over time. And it's large companies like Siemens and things, um, big crane companies that are working on, on those kinds of activities. Where we do see a huge opportunity is around efficiencies. We've got three Canadian companies that are um, basically AI-led uh, companies that are looking at how to improve the efficiencies from everything from uh, truck scheduling in and out of the port to um, looking at how to improve uh, uh, safe fuel and reduce emissions from customized routing of ships across as they come across the Pacific. Thank you. Um, we do have one more question, but I'm actually going to save that for open networking after this. As we wrap up, um, anything else that you didn't get to talk about or anything else that you'd like to leave us with? Well, what I'd really like to say for everybody in the room is, you know, the, the blue economy, there's a place for everyone to play in it. And it doesn't mean that you have to, do, it's not all about marine research. I'm hoping you're understanding that, right? So whether you're in life sciences, whether you're a biotech company, if you're um, a consultant in construction, whatever might be, if you really think about um, our coastal communities, how, you, how goods move in and out of that, all the things that you look in your manufacturer environment, everything that you're looking in your lab environment, everything that might be pet petrochemicals that could be now a kelp-based or a seaweed-based product. It's really limitless. It, it just uh, think really open-minded. And if you need some inspiration, come to Ignite 22. Love it. I love it. So Ignite 22 in May. Um, we have the information on LinkedIn Live and on the chat room here. With that, thank
thank you so much, Anne, for being with us. For those sure. of you online, we are going to stop the LinkedIn Live now. We will bring over those who are in the, the attendees on Zoom. So just give us one minute while we do some logistical things. And join us on May 6th. We're, we're still formalizing our speakers, but we will look forward to seeing you then as part of Friday Coffee Meetup. All right. Thank thanks you. for having us.